any because of the world we live in and the internet that any creative person you don't need millions of followers or 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 or, or or anything like that. You just need, and initially the first draft of this article he put out, he's, he's tweaked it slightly because people took it too literally, but he, he said, all you need is a thousand true fans to make a living as a creative of any sort. If you lead an interesting life, good pictures will happen. Oh, nice. You might well be my sexiest sounding guest. Go somewhere you've never been before and take a camera. We had this gorgeous Mediterranean light just flowing in. Which as do we win? A Dartford. Very nice. Your first 10,000 pictures of your worst. Let's sit down, let's have a cup of tea. Welcome to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to another episode of the Standout Photography Show with me, Matthew Walker, where as always, it is my honour and privilege to sit down with the finest working photographers in the world to unpack their systems, workflows and find out what enables them to perform consistently at the very top of their profession. Now, you may have noticed that we've been away for a small while, but good news, we're back. So yes, if you are a brand new listener to the show, a very warm welcome. My name is Matthew. I am going to be your host. And if you are a long time listener of the show, goodness me, have I missed you. Welcome back. Now then, what is new? at the Standout Photography Show. Well, first of all, exciting news. This episode and future episodes, plus the entire back catalogue, is now available in glorious HD right here on YouTube itself. So if you are watching this on YouTube, hello there. And if you have a burning desire to see my face and all of the wonderful guests we have here on the show coming up, you can catch us right here on YouTube. Simply type in the Standout Photography Show and you will see every single episode. Secondly, show times. Now, previously, episodes have gone out every single Friday, but because we only have the finest working photographers in the world right here on the show, Episodes will still go out on a Friday, but they may be slightly more sporadic, which, let's be honest, is more exciting because you never know when a brand new episode is going to land into your podcast feed. And finally, social media. If there is a photographer that you would like to hear in conversation, you can let me know on my brand new Instagram and Twitter handle, which is Matthew Walker TV. How much easier is that to remember. Once again, that is Matthew Walker TV if there is a photographer that you would like to hear in conversation. Now then, speaking of which, please allow me to introduce today's guest. My guest today is none other than Sean Tucker. That is at Sean Tuck on Instagram, www.seantucker.photography on the World Wide Webs and Sean Tucker on YouTube. Sean is a photographer, filmmaker and writer based right here in the UK and in his own words his career to date he's been very fortunate to tell visual stories through stills and video for individuals NGOs and multinational corporations across more than wait for it 20 countries and he's traveled many long hours as I'm sure many of you have as a one-man film crew and photographer now during our conversation we discuss the topic of followers and Sean is the most followed photographer we've ever had on the show on social media. Check this out. He's got a whopping 352,000 followers on Instagram and 482,000 on YouTube. And we go into great depth about how he managed to achieve this. But as you will see, Sean is incredibly humble about his work and so whilst we do talk about how he built this audience we also discuss how he celebrates fellow photographers something which he is incredibly passionate about as well as mastering color through color blindness yes sean is colorblind would you believe which is extraordinary once you look at his instagram feed and see how skilled he is at mastering color we also discuss finding your own style why you only need a thousand followers which is a lot less than sean has obviously popularity versus quality is perfection fear now if we've got any perfectionists out there this is a very important topic which i'm sure you will relate to 
And how do you know when a personal project is finished? Again, something I've discussed with many photographers here on the show, but Sean has a very interesting process into when he thinks a personal project is finished. So without further ado, sit back, enjoy the show, switch off from the world, and let me introduce the one and only Mr. Sean Tucker. How are you, sir? Yeah, I'm all right, man. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Sean, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, you're welcome, man. That's Thanks also for inviting a, me. Pleasure. That's also a sensational setup that you've got there. Well, the, the, the mic particularly is for, because with this book coming out, a lot of people have been asking for an audio book version. So I was trying to get some uh, kit together so that of I could course. record some decent audio. Yeah. Yes. Well, we'll come on to talk about the book, actually. But, you know, while we're here, because obviously I can see what you are surrounded by for those that can't what's your work environment like where you're sat now yeah um it's it, yeah i think it might look fancier than it is <laughs> but like i mean i've got i've got a i've got a very old imac in the back corner there which has my um my keyboard attached so that that is like my little music station now it's a very slow old machine but it, i just use it for logic and i've got some plugins for it so every now and again i'll go and because i try and do some of the sort of background music for some of the videos i produce so that's a little space there um over here this is just like a the little roadcaster thing i've got recently um so mess with audio and then um just my little there's you there i am <laughs> That's a wonderful uh, set. Yeah, I mean, it's just, this is just uh, this is my little office, so where I do kind of video editing and, and uh, image editing and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now, there's also a very lovely image to your left on your wall. Now, then, out of all of the images, that's the one. Out of all of yeah. the images that you've taken, why that one for the wall? Oh well, this isn't mine actually. This is uh, a talented photographer, um, Mavis uh, CW on Instagram. So uh, actually all around my house, I, I, I would show you, but um, this is like tied, this webcam's tied to the computer with a USB. All around my house are these same black gallery frames. So last year um, in February, a bunch of us did uh, an exhibition down in London of our street photography. There were nine of us street photographers. And uh, after we kind of packed up the gallery space, um, I bought all the frames that were that, that hadn't sold because I knew I was moving up to Yorkshire and needed to set up a house. And I thought it'd be quite cool to have, I basically bought 40 something frames. So all around my house are these frames and some of them still have the prints in them from friends of mine. And then lots of them have got sort of my own images and stuff as well. So it's kind of a mix of friends photographs and my photographs and yeah. Again, I'm pleased you mentioned that exhibition because we'll come on to talk about that in more detail. But before we do, what was the photographer that you just mentioned then? Mavis CW. So yeah, just Mavis first name and then just CW initials for surname on, on Instagram. She's one chapter on Instagram, actually, is at one chapter. Uh, she's great. She's she's a London photographer who has a she shoots all film. So uh, on, a, on a Leica M6 with Tri-X, uh, black and white. And she's she hasn't actually even been shooting that long. I think it's only been two or three years, but she's already got such a it's, it's like she was shooting in the 50s. She's got a really classical kind of mature style to her work that's, that's super timeless. She's, she's she, I mean, especially how good she is, how early on in her, her journey. I think she's going to be a monster, absolute monster. You know, it's one of the things that I noticed straight away when I was doing my research for this conversation is that you are, you're very passionate about celebrating other photographers how important is that for you to a follow other photographers, but also b to use your platform to give them a voice as well? Because I know you've made some videos about other photographers, which is something that not a huge amount of photographers do. It's nine times out of ten all about their work. How important is that for you to celebrate other photographers? It's my favorite thing I do, honestly, on my on my YouTube channel is making these little documentaries and and letting other people talk about their images and their process. And I just, I mean. I, I, the sad thing, if I'm going to be honest, the sad thing about a lot of YouTube channels is they're kind of like very thinly disguised marketing pl ploys. <laughs> trying to, it's it's like it's like mostly for self promotion. Look who I am, and I just think that's missing a trick. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, if I only talk about my own photography, I don't do enough 
varied photography to make hundreds of videos on it. There's not hundreds of videos to talk about my photography. I can cover it, you know, most of what I do in, in 10 videos. So why not instead go out, find other photographers who I think are, are maybe lesser known, but are super talented that I can, uh, that I can promote their work and show what they do. And then I, I really feel like it's a privilege that I get to host those interviews on my platform under my name. I feel like I'm cheating somehow because people will still associate those documentaries with me because I made those documentaries, but they'll tie it into other people's work who are doing incredible work that is, that is much better than what I'm doing in, in, a, in a bunch of ways. So it's a perfect synergy for me. I think people get um, their work promoted to perhaps a new audience or gets extended past the people who already know about them. So they're super happy. And I'm super happy because I'm getting much more interesting films made for my channel that are helping people as well. And I'm just kind of the, the, the middleman in a way. But making those films is my favorite sort of filmmaking because I get to be a bit more of a filmmaker. If I'm just sitting on a sofa, you know, talking crap for 30 minutes, I'm not really being a filmmaker, I'm giving a talk. But when I get to go out and make films with other photographers, I get to be behind the camera and shooting things to make it more visually interesting and tell more of a story. So creatively, it's, it's much more satisfying as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's one of the reasons that I wanted to start this podcast was because it can be mm. also quite a, I don't want to say lonely existence as a photographer, but you know, you spend a lot of time on your own. Yeah. And, and there's so many of us that have so much in common that it's so nice to, to spend time with other photographers, learn from them and exactly what you just said, celebrate their work. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of insecurity, I think, with photographers as well. They they seem to be a very kind of solitary, competitive bunch. And I I initially I didn't start in photography. I started in video actually. And video by nature is a much more collaborative process. Um, you you need people to help you out with things. So when I started moving over into the photography space, I was quite surprised how everyone keeps each other at a distance. And there's lots of gossip. So and so does, and I don't. And I'm threatened by his work, and I'm jealous of so and so's work. And it's there's not a, there's not the same kind of community, and I just decided going in. I'm gonna I'm gonna break this down for everything I can do. I'm gonna break this down, and I don't I don't have that sense of being threatened by other photographers. I think we're all doing our own thing, and the more people I can meet and who I can inspire, they can inspire me, and we can, you know, I'm not out to copy anyone's work. I think that's where the threat comes in. But I mean, you know, some of my closest friends are photographers. I I you know take long walks on the street with other street photographers. We, there's no, there's no like, oh, you're copying my shots or any of this weirdness. Like we know what we're doing. We know we have some integrity. There's none of that weirdness. And, and then we can just, in, like you say, enjoy each other's company instead of sitting at home alone and isolating ourselves, being bitter that we're not better than so-and-so. We have 10,000 less Instagram followers than so-and-so. Who cares, man? It's not, it's not interesting stuff, you know? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. But let's, let's start there because you've mentioned where mentioned you started in video and again when I was doing my research you're a filmmaker you're a writer and in your own words a maker of things but why photography for you I think I always I always enjoyed it from from even even when I was a kid I used to have a little sort of point and shoot camera running around taking film shots um, so I've always enjoyed it and I've always come back to it at different stages of my journey but it was it was um after I left my career with the church back in South Africa, that uh, I had to start my career from scratch in my early 30s. And it was a friend who said to me, you know, well, it sucks that you're going to begin again, but it means you can choose whatever you want to do now. Like, so, because whatever you do, you're going to be starting on that same bottom rung. So to pick the right ladder um, and make sure you're going up a ladder you actually enjoy. And I thought, well, what if I could take this thing that I'd already been working in video a little bit on the side of that church work, but what if I could also um, take the photography stuff I enjoy, bring it all together and try and make that pay the bills. So for me, it was just, I, I loved it already. And, and it would, in my mind, it would be a dream if I could actually one day turn it into a job, which I've slowly managed to do. That's a really important thing that you just said then as well about the, the ladder, because it's something I always think as well, it's better to be at the bottom of a ladder you want to climb than, yeah. than halfway up a ladder that you don't. And I think there's, I could be wrong, but I certainly know a lot of my friends who would love to make a living as a photographer, but they're halfway up a ladder that is either financial, yeah. uh, financially successful for them. And it's so hard to, for them to break away. 
Well, I mean, th- there's a saying, isn't it? It's something like, uh, it's something to do with that ladder, but it's something like before you start climbing the ladder, make sure you place it up against the right wall. You know, it's that kind of idea, you know? And I think, uh, but, but I think a lot of us get that wrong. Don't get me wrong. I've had to restart my career a bunch of times in my life. It's, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes, but I think the, real, the minute we realize and we can find a way to make that brave jump to the thing we really care about, if we can find a way to do that, it's, it's worth doing earlier rather than later. Yeah, and it is a very, very brave jump to do as well. So what did, what did that look like for you if you're starting out from scratch almost, uh, early 30s? What steps did you take to, to start your career as a photographer and as, as a filmmaker? I mean, it was... I think it, it was what everyone experiences. I mean, I, I know people might look at photographers like they might look at what I'm doing on YouTube and think, well, it's always been easy for this guy. I mean, it, I, I had the same experience that a lot of people who are struggling now had in that I had just left this career with the church. Um, I'd actually been fired. Uh, we didn't get on and I'd said things they didn't <laughs> like. So I was moved on and I went from standing on a stage on Sundays, having a room full of people listening to me to um, going to the local restaurant to serve coffee because I, I had to wait tables. Like there's no way I could make money off photography off the bat. And I would have the people from the church coming in and I had to, to serve them coffee and get out of their way. Like it was a really humbling experience. Um, because there's, I, I thought in my head it would be easier. I thought like, well, I, I'm an all right photographer. There's no way I won't be able to get some work coming in, but I couldn't get anything. I mean, I, literally nothing. I, so all my bills were paid, um, with waiting tables. And I just used all my spare time to try and build that skill set up. And that was a good two or three years doing that. Um, living very small, um, just waiting tables and using that spare time to, to, to build things up. And then I, I, I did a job for a friend of mine who just opened a cafe and uh, she wanted some shots done of the food in the cafe for her website. It's like an online menu kind of thing. And, and she really liked those and that got noticed by uh, a company in South Africa that was a, um, uh, they, they're a fancy kitchenware company. So they sell like, you know, KitchenAid mixers and, you know, fancy knives and saucepans and all the rest of it. And they, they're like an e-commerce company. So it's online. They ship it out around the country. Um, and I got a job with them. The first full-time job I got as a photographer, and this is about three years after leaving the church. It took that long to get it, um, was doing food photography and product photography for them. And then slowly from that things, you know, then I came back to the UK and it was uh, product photography for a company doing shooting like uh, furniture, you know, sofas and beds and those kind of things. Again, like not romantic at all. It was, it's, it just becomes a, a technical production line. There's no creativity to be had. You have to shoot every, you got to get through 50 sofas in a day all from the same six angles, same six shots with the same lighting. You can't move anything. It's just a production line you hammer through and then lots of fiddly editing to get them all onto nice, clean white backgrounds with drop shadows. Um, but I've always felt grateful that I could make money with a camera in hand. And then I just made sure that the photography I cared about, like what I was doing with portrait photography and slowly with street photography was, was what I filled my spare time with because it became apparent, like I'm not going to be creatively fulfilled with the day job, even if it is with a camera. I need to work on that in my own time. So it kind of slowly progressed, but definitely took a while. So it sounds like you you learnt on the job as you were going along rather than taking the assisting route. Is that yeah. correct? And I asked because one of the first things that I noticed about looking through your Instagram feed, and I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone that wants to to look at your work, your your use of color is is beautiful. And oh, thank you. And that kind of that level of detail and that level of skill normally from what I've seen in the past has come from people that have assisted others and yeah. learned that way. Cause it's, you know, it's a hard thing to achieve color. It's one of those things that yeah. it's, it's so difficult and, and yours is, it really is beautiful. How did you, how did you start to develop your own style and learn that technique? Yeah, I mean, I mean, my Instagram honestly is more of a scrapbook. It's not, it's not a portfolio. It's where I'm, I post every day. I mean, it's impossible to post a good photograph every day. So it's just something which I keep generating over. But, but, um, I mean, it's it's probably important to say as well that I'm actually colorblind. Um, I've got like um, no, yeah, uh, what is it, deuteronomy uh, colorblindness. So I I struggle to differentiate between close hues of red and green. 
Um, so I've had to like work hard um, to, to work out what I'm seeing and work out what that means everyone else is seeing. If that, I've got two steps. I can't just look at something and go, that what it lo- that's what it looks like. I have to go like, that's what I see, but that probably means this is what other people see, which, is, which makes it a little difficult. But I mean, it's, it's been, it's because, because, uh, you know, assisting is definitely a route you can go and you will learn a lot, but I just didn't have that opportunity. I didn't, uh, I, I, that's not the situation I found myself in. So I had to, um, I had to learn for myself and I learned by looking at great photographers work and, and working out and reverse engineering what I was seeing that I liked. And then parallel to that, I was working on, um, how I would shoot those things or see, or even recognize those scenes out and about. Um, or if it's in a portrait studio, how I would create those scenes with lighting and backgrounds and, you know, clothing subjects wearing or whatever. And then also the editing side, the, the software side. So getting good at learning how to use hue saturation, luminance and curves and, and, and the, the, those different tools within um, editing software and, and bringing all those together slowly over time. And it's still progress. Like it's still, I'm not there yet. I'm just making my way towards something. I think that, you know, the, the more of a handle I get on those things, the more I can start to, to feed that stuff into my work. And it does change, you know, it, it, it shifts over time. Um, but I think it's moving somewhere and it's sort of coalescing over time, which is nice. The, the biggest compliment I can get on from people on Instagram is sometimes they'll say like, oh, the minute I saw this, I knew it was one of yours because that means that there's something about it that they're recognizing as a style that I'm putting into things. But that almost creeps up on you in increments because when you're in it day to day, making a thousand choices for things and against things, you know, it, it happens slowly over time. But when you get a few years down the road and people start to recognize something that's yours, you realize this thing's been coming together slowly the whole time, you know. I would agree with that as well. I mean, I'm I'm relatively new to your work, which is one of the wonderful things about this podcast. I've been introduced to so many incredible photographers, but I would agree with that person when they said I can spot one of your images because, I mean, I'm scrolling through your Instagram feed now and mm. everything is very unique. Every image is unique, of course, but there is a definite style yeah. that you have developed. Yeah. While we're on Instagram, actually, because it's one of the, it's one of those yeah. things that I, a lot of photographers, <laughs> well, a lot of photographers I've spoken to struggle with it. And by that, I mean, so Simon Norfolk, for example, when I spoke to him, he had, and still really has no interest in Instagram or social media. Mm. He's a photographer and he just wants to uh, take photographs and tell stories. But he found himself in a position with, I think it was Nat Geo, he said, where they basically said to him, look, unless you have an online profile, you're not Mm -hmm. going to work for us. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how good your work is. Um, Unless you have that following, someone is, you know, another photographer is going to beat you to the post. So on Instagram, just as an example here, you've got 352,000 followers. And as a comparison here, Joe McNally, who I spoke to, he's got 238. Simon uh, Norfolk himself, 165. Art Wolf, 102. These are you know, incredible photographers with long, long careers. How did you build that audience on Instagram? Was it purely, yeah. um, did it just naturally organically grow over time or did you consciously work at growing it? There's a really simple answer in my case. I mean, uh, and that's embarrassing to hear like a great photographer like Joe McNally has less than me. It just shows you that that social media numbers do not equal quality or talent. That's not how it works. Like my, my, my however many followers were because they came across from YouTube. So they, they, I was doing I something on YouTube and talking in a way that people really enjoyed. And I would just put my tag at the end of those videos. And that's why they came across. Like I, I try and say this to people all the time, like, it's a real mistake to think that the social media score you get because of likes or follows or whatever is any signifier of of talent or quality. And if you want proof, go and look at the fact that there are cats out there with millions of followers. It doesn't mean they're super talented. uh, Owners are super talented photographers. It means people like kittens. It's not what it means. So you have to stop taking seriously this idea that that number signifies quality popularity and, and and quality are not the same at all um so yeah that's the very simple answer as to why i've got that there 
yeah, no, and I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. In your case, the quality is absolutely there, so it's completely justified. But that does make a lot of sense about uh, coming across from YouTube, because again, your YouTube following is it's incredible. It's four. You've got four hundred eighty-two thousand people that enjoy your work on YouTube. And again, I guess it's kind of the same question. Was that did that grow organically, or again, was there conscious steps that you took in order to grow that audience? Uh, a bit of both, probably. I mean, I, I YouTube's a funny one because I I, um, I know why people follow me on YouTube. I know that I think I'm 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 occupying a space that people feel that there's a lack of in the photography community and that I don't talk about gear or do gear reviews or, or really do that much technical stuff. I talk a lot more about why do you need to take this photograph? How do you stay mentally healthy as, as, as a creative person? How do you deal with your creative jealousy of other people? How do you get through creative block? Those kind of things are the subjects that I spend the most time on. And I, I think there's less people talking about that. So early on when I started doing that, I was, uh, especially early on, I was really one of the only people doing that. I mean, there's more now. So I think people gravitated towards that and subscribe. But again, like, I mean, it's, it's all relative. I mean, you can say that, you know, there's whatever it is, it's almost like half a million subscribers, but, but there's, there's channels with much more than me as well. And there's channels with much less, it's all on a scale. And those are for all different reasons. And I think, there's lots about it. Like people who are starting now, I think will struggle more because I think the later you start on YouTube, the harder it is to grow things. I'm also aware that if I wanted my channel to grow faster, I could have been, I could have mixed in some gear reviews and done other things. Cause anytime I mention a camera brand in the title, that video goes crazy. So I, I know that if I wanted to play the game, I, I could, I could either make those sort of videos or just, hint that I'm making those sort of videos. I could have done that to grow it faster as well, but I always had this idea that it was about staying true to the stuff that I wanted to talk about and building, building a core following who cared about what I was doing. And, and that's different from the big number. So for example, if you, if, if you look at that, if you look at my channel and go, okay, well, he's got almost half a million subscribers go and look at the actual views on the videos and it's between 30 and 50,000, which means that less than 10% of people who hit subscribe one day are still watching those videos. It's not a real number, the subscriber number. And you can go and check any channel that you know, any big channel that you know, and it's about the same. In fact, it's often, it's often between five and 10% of people who one day hit subscribe who are still watching those videos. So that subscriber number is fiction. It's one day someone saw a tutorial from me about using one speed light for portraits. They thought, oh, I'll subscribe to that. They did it. But then I made a bunch of waffly philosophical stuff. I thought, well, this guy's a pretentious twat. And they moved on. Like it's not, it's not, it's, it doesn't mean anything. But before I started, I don't know if you've read that article Kevin Kelly put out a few years ago called A Thousand True Fans. Have you heard of that article? I have not, but I will definitely read it. What was it called? Kevin Kelly? A Thousand Kelly? True Fans. Yeah. Kevin Kelly. So it's online. It's a really good article. And I'd read it before I started YouTube. And I had this in mind. He, he basically has this thesis that any, because of the world we live in, in the internet, that any creative person, you don't need millions of followers or, 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 or anything like that. You just need, and initially the first draft of this article he put out, he's, he's tweaked it slightly because people took it too literally, but he, he said, all you need is a thousand true fans to make a living as a creative of any sort. And a, and a true fan is defined as somebody who will, you know, buy a ticket to a talk you give or buy a book if you put it out or buy a t-shirt or a mug or whatever you're doing, who actually support you financially in what you do because they believe in what you're doing. Just a thousand. And I had that in mind when I started, you know, what, what I'm actually out to do is not inflate that big number and, and fill it with just people who don't really care about you anymore and moved on a long time ago. It was to focus on building a core in the middle of that who really care about what you're doing so that what I'm doing can be sustained into the long term. And that big number is, is kind of irrelevant. And I'm sure that I have more than a thousand true fans within that big number. And that's all I care about. Those are the people I make videos for. Those are the people I write books for. Those are the people I'm making photography for. And all the rest is just noise. And it's sort of whittling it down to to that quality audience at the middle that really care about you. And you could have a million followers, I believe, and have 50 true fans, but you could also have 
1,500 followers and have 1,000 of those be true fans. It's not directly proportional. So it's working on building that core who really care, I think. Yeah, of course. And I read what you mentioned then about uh, sustaining an audience over a long period of time. And I saw a lovely quote on one of your videos from Bruce Springsteen, which was getting an audience is hard. Sustaining an audience is hard. It demands a consistency of thought, of purpose, and of action over a long period of time. I thought that was a really lovely quote. On that note, actually, because I also saw something in one of your videos where you talked about you're a perfectionist. And whilst that can be a wonderful, wonderful quality, because I struggle with this as well, it can also make you question what you're putting out there. Does, so I guess this question is twofold. Does having that audience help you as a perfectionist in that, will you put something out that you maybe are unsure about, but the feedback will give you that confirmation? Does that make sense? Yes, but n the answer is no, because <clears throat> I, think, I mean, this, um, you'll know if you're a perfectionist, like it can be crippling. It can be. Yes. Um, and, and those doubts don't go away. And, and the thing about releasing anything onto the internet is you will get every opinion. So, and you will gravitate because we have a negativity bias as human beings, you'll gravitate towards the negative opinion. So if you're a perfectionist, you, you need, I think, to learn to tune out a lot of that noise that you get in response to your work and you have to you almost have to internalize it and back yourself so i believe in the video that i'm putting out today i believe it says exactly what i want to say some people will love it some people will hate it and that's just the way that it is but if you start taking that feedback seriously and adjusting to try and please the crowd it's that it's that idea of you know if you if you aim at nothing you'll hit it every time if you're trying to please everybody you're going to end up creating a a wishy-washy mess, and you're going to lose what you're trying to say. I, I would rather err on the side of really saying, well, exactly what I believe and being rejected for that than being than, than just boring people because I'm not really saying anything because I'm scared of offending a small group here that I don't know really mm. what they want from me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of the actual perfection of it, like I'll always criticize what I do. You know, I can see the mistakes more than anybody. But I've also learned to just give it to the world because if I hold, I talk about this a little bit in the book I've just written actually, that you can tell when you've walked into a perfectionist's creative space because it will be filled with work that's really good, but it's being in the, it's in the process of either being hidden or destroyed because, and, and you'll say, oh my gosh, but this is brilliant. Why don't you show people this? And they might nod and go, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll get around to it. But you know, the minute you walk out, they're going to hide it on the top shelf or burn it because the fear of giving it to the world when they can still see that it's not perfect, it's good, but it's not perfect. The fear of giving it to the world and maybe being criticized for it, or maybe it not being received the way that you want it to be, or, or people don't think it's as good as you think it is, is just too terrifying. And I've just learned that I need to be more courageous than that. And I think perfectionism is actually fear. It's, it's fear of how what you made will be received. And I need to give it to the world when it's in a good state, not a perfect state, because it has the chance of doing good for other people then. But if I'm being a perfectionist, I'm holding it back for fear that it's not perfect. It stands no chance of doing any good for anybody because I'm not giving it away. Um, so I'm kind of hard on myself ab about giving it away when it's good enough. Um, yeah. That, that takes me on rather nicely, actually, to a question that I was going to ask. And I hadn't really thought about perfectionism as fear before. So that's an interesting mm. way of thinking about it. But you mentioned something then about putting stuff out when it's nearly ready. So, for example, if you're working on a personal project, how do you know when something is at a point where you're ready to put it out there and I ask this because you know yeah. talking about perfectionism I've been working with a lovely man called Eddie for best part of about nine months now and I've got a lovely body of work mm. and but it, I can feel something inside me it's not ready mm. and I need to keep working with him and and finding the point where I go it's that's it you know it's it's in its place now how yeah. how does that work for you how do you know when something is ready 
I mean, what you're talking about is really common, I think, in projects. It's like a gut feeling that it's not finished. But I think we have to have self-awareness at that point because that gut feeling, if it's uninterrogated, it could be that it's not ready and you can feel that there's more to uncover there. Or it could be that we just don't want it to end because we're afraid to finish it off and release it in the world. And it, 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 equally, it could be one of those two things. And only you know that. And only you know that by getting honest enough with yourself about where where that impulse is actually coming from and what it's actually telling you it's it's emotional intelligence stuff it's it's like we all have emotions you know we all you know if we get cut off in traffic by someone we all get that like uh get angry at the person who just did it but they might not have even noticed that they did it or 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 they might have done it deliberately because they're a bit of an ass like you don't actually know what their intention was but we're angry as if they deliberately tried to get us at that point we have to ask ourselves, like, did I did I just get angry because that guy cut me off in traffic and that's so offensive? Or actually is there more going on? Am I am I am I living in a city where I feel unseen? Or am I frustrated at my boss uh, and my job? Or do I feel powerless in my relationship? Is it actually about something else and this was just a spark? Like if we don't learn to do the emotional intelligence thing and actually ask, beyond the fact that I just had a feeling, let me just slavishly obey it. What does that feeling actually point to? What's it actually telling me? And that's like self-work stuff. So like, I feel like this project isn't finished is fine, but you have to, uh, you have to dig and work out what that's actually telling you. Because I, I, from, what I, from what I know of myself, at different times in my life, I was right, it wasn't finished. There was more to uncover and it was intuition. And at other point I was, I was lying to myself and actually I was just terrified of finishing it off and releasing it. And only you can pass that. Yeah. Yes, of course. And when I actually spoke to Joe McNally, he said when he finds himself in that place, and it's what I've, I've tried to do going forward, he doubles down, he works harder. Right. Rather than, because some people take a step back from the work and, yeah. and let it marinate itself. Whereas he was very much, you know, I'm going to take action and I'll, I'll work twice as hard to, mm. to find the moment when it's ready. And I, for me, that worked. And I'm sure for, hopefully for other photographers, that will that will work as well. Let's just journey back slightly to your street photography, because again, in one of your videos, you, you talked about a technique, which Ian Gavin first spoke about in the very first episode, actually. And Ian used to walk home every night from the tube. And it was about a 25 minute walk. And his challenge with himself was to take a photograph that he was happy, an interesting photograph that he was happy on that journey. And you, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, did something very similar. And it started your journey with photography, uh, with street photography, I beg your pardon. Yeah. Would you mind talking us through that? Yeah, no, it was back when I was, um, the day job was shooting sofas. And I mean, obviously, I just got to a stage where I didn't like my camera anymore. I didn't, I didn't want to pick it up anymore because it was associated with studios and lights and and taking photographs of beds asking rich people to buy more furniture it wasn't associated with creativity or good stuff and so and this was back when i was shooting on big canon 5d mark twos um and i felt that i felt like i was falling out of love with photography because it was just becoming a technical day job i might as well have been a plumber i was just doing a job for a company with a tool mm. um and that's what it was being resigned to for me so i just decided to take action and do something completely different with photography that was pure creativity again. So that was the challenge I gave myself. I used to have to walk from uh, Clapham Junction Station to uh, Clapham North, where my flat was. Oh gosh, I know that route very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I would just, uh, at the time, and I, and I left my camera in the bag. I didn't take the camera out and I just used my phone for the first probably year. I mean, I'm just going to take it back to untechnical photography that I, I can't fiddle with the settings too much on this. I'm just going to intuitively shoot things. I think that are interesting and see if I can get one image a day that I'm kind of happy with on that walk. It doesn't take any extra time. I've got to walk that route anyway. So I'm not, you know, it's not costing me anything in terms of time, but it is good use of time to try and fall back in love with photography. And that kind of started me. Um, I mean, I don't think of myself as a street photographer, um, uh, and because it, I don't take sort of traditional, what people think of as traditional street photography, it's just whatever I saw, wherever I was. Um, but it, it, it got me taking photographs again of things that I saw and it didn't matter what those things were. 
and that just became a habit and then something that i fell back in love with how how easy and intuitive and satisfying creatively that was which kind of got the ball rolling for what i'm doing now and have been doing for a while and on just posting an image a day to instagram it doesn't matter if it's brilliant or not it just becomes a I, I, I really believe it's, it's like that uh, Cartier-Bresson quote, isn't it? Your first 10,000 photographs, your worst. Mm. I'm trying to get those out fast. I think people make this mistake. They kind of get into photography and they go, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sit on the couch with my camera at the ready, waiting to be inspired. I'm going to get out and take a brilliant photograph. But you don't understand that you really have to take a ton of crap photographs before you get to the good stuff. So if you're not out there every day forcing yourself to shoot and shoot a lot, you're not going to be learning. You know, you can't sit on the couch waiting for inspiration to strike. You stand up and you're great straight away. You have to shoot through the rubbish. And that's what I feel like I'm, I'm doing. So if I've got, you know, whatever it is, two, two and a half thousand photographs sitting there on Instagram, I'm a quarter of the way there. Keep going. Maybe, maybe after I've got through the next 75%, I'll actually be a decent photographer. But that's, that's the journey for me. And I'm doing it publicly by choice because I feel like, and, you know, I, I have to feel some, some pretty ridiculous comments from people. Well, this isn't your normal work. As if like I'm presenting a portfolio, I'm trying to explain, I even put in the bio, this is a scrapbook. This is not my, this is not my portfolio. I'm letting you in on the process of me making a mess and digging myself out of a hole over a long period of time. It's a teaching tool. But that I feel like is more helpful to people who get it because they can go, okay, yeah, I can go back to the beginning of his Instagram and see, my word, he was really rubbish at the start because it's all still there from 10 years ago, you know? Um, but I can see that he's also getting better over time. And that, so if I go to my Instagram, I can see that I'm also getting better and we're all on a journey. We're all slowly getting better by taking lots of bad photographs and getting to the good ones, you know? So for you, when you're, when you're out now at this point in your career, and we talked about earlier about building a, a style, what, what are you looking for? What are you naturally drawn to? when you're out shooting street photography now? Uh, it's, I'm more interested in spaces and light uh, than I am in, in people and interactions. And that's mm. why I say I'm not really a traditional street photographer. I would put what I'm doing now more in the vein of, of photographers like um, Ray Metzger or, or what Fan Ho was doing in Hong Kong or uh, some of Trent Park's work. It's, it's, it's a lot of it is, is just, I saw interesting light falling somewhere and that's what I want to capture, which, which leaves a lot of the images that I post, you know, some people could legitimately ask, what's the point of taking that photograph? And I'm like, well, there isn't one. There's no message in it. I'm not trying to tell you anything with it. I just thought this was interesting, but I also am aware that the more I do that, the, the better I'm training myself to recognize good light when I see it. So if, mm. if I go out for a paid job with somebody to do natural light portraits, I am now far more able to recognize and place a subject in interesting light because I teach myself how to do that every single day um, than I was five years ago because of that process. And that's just what interests me. And what I love about that as well is it means I don't have to take those images on the street. I can go out to the countryside and take those images, or I can go on holiday to another part of the world and take exactly the same sort of images because there's interesting light no matter where you go in the world. Mm. So it's, it's like a very universal way of shooting, I think, and hopefully travels well. I guess as well, there, there was some context to my question there, which I, I didn't give you the information. What, what, prompted me to ask that question was that I saw a picture, a black and white image that you posted the other day. And your comment was a more messy shot than I'd mm -hmm. normally take, but I liked the intersection between these two as mm -hmm. they passed. And I'll put a link to the image in the show notes, but that was the prompt for that question of what mm -hmm. are you looking for? Why, why for you was that particular image messy? And actually how was it mm -hmm. for you as a perfectionist to post something yeah, that wasn't your normal, uh, your normal style, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the light and shadow stuff in that shot is probably my normal style. But I think what I meant by that is I don't photograph people like that very often that close, right. And uh, that is a more traditional street photograph, I think than I'd normally post. Uh, and the, the reason it was messy for me was because it was a it was a reaction shot. I, I'm, 
I'm too controlled. I know that. I know the next stage of growth for me with my own work is to stop being as neat and tidy with my compositions because I'm trying to be too linear and too careful. And I think that might make me too rigid in the images that I put out there. And that's the, that could be a negative side of that perfectionism to have, needing things to be lined up too perfectly. Um, and I know that I need to, to play more and allow those kind of those messy shots to happen and post them anyway. So that was kind of me trying to force myself out of a rut. I feel like I'm getting stuck in. If that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. And I'm sure will resonate to a lot of people listening as well. Cause I, yeah. again, it's the perfectionist thing. And by the yeah. sound of it, you struggle with it as well in that when I take an image, I'm always looking for maybe a clean image is maybe the right way to describe it. Yeah, um, I yeah. hope that people understand what I mean by that, but you know, the perfectionist in you wants very clean lines and wants everything to be perfect. And sometimes particularly with artistic choices, that's just not how it is, not how it works, yeah. but actually it does take me onto something else that I wanted to discuss with you, which was personal projects. And we don't necessarily have to discuss this one. It could be something else, but the one that I was drawn to when looking at your work was the project that you did in South Africa, which was the portraits, um, of the men that helped guide you through your teens. Mm. And you talked about three Ps, and I love this. In fact, it's going on my wall. Prepare, mm. plan, and pre-visualize. Mm. And when I spoke to uh, the lovely Peter Dench, yeah. and he, he talked about exactly this thing. He said, by giving myself, by preparing and, and planning and giving myself parameters for a personal project it gives me far more creative choices yes so what does that look like for you and it, the prepare plan and pre-visualize what does that look like for you on a personal project and again we can use that one as an example um or you can yeah pick something else if that well, is better for you i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna shout out another photographer like um alex soth who's a um a magnum photographer on the magnum website he's actually um got a, uh, a course, which is like a, a, a pay to, to watch basically 15 video lessons and you can pay to watch those. I, 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 anyone who's getting into personal projects, if you've got the cash to spend on, on watching that little course, I really recommend it because the way he describes it, I think is, is, is much better than, than I've sort of formulated. So what I'm gonna tell you, I'm ripping straight from what he said in this course is, is, it's, is it's this kind of fine balance between giving yourself a physical limitation and then exploring within that because if you say to yourself and i think this is where people get stuck it's that it's that like paralysis of choice if you just go like yes. i i want to i want to do a personal project but i have no idea what to do it on well you're never going to do it then because it's just there's just too much to choose from so he gives the example of, of a, one of his early books called sleeping in the sleeping by the mississippi i think it's called and all he said to himself is uh, he lives up i think in minnesota and they've got the uh, the Mississippi River that runs through Minnesota, it runs all the way down the length of the US, I think it ends down in Louisiana somewhere, I think. So he said, all I'm gonna do is I'm going to get in a car and I'm gonna drive from where I am and I'm going to follow the river. And I'm only, I'm, the, my physical limitation is I have to take images within say a hundred meters of the river. That's, that, I, I can't go outside of that. That's my physical limitation. And I'm gonna drive that route. And as he started to drive that route and take photographs, <laughs> a theme emerged from that, which was that he, he saw um, an old rusty bed that was, had been abandoned by the river and then he carried on going. And then there was a dream catcher hanging in one of the trees. And then, and then he came across this guy who had kind of um, made model airplanes and it looked like, you know, reverting back to sort of childhood and dreams of childhood. And he said, the theme of dreams and sleep started to emerge. So this book, Sleeping by the Mississippi, was the, was the result. But he didn't have the theme in mind necessary. He gave himself the physical limitation. That's what I'm going to go and do. I think Peter Dench is very similar. You know, he said, very I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to follow the A1, yeah. you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow the route of the A1 and I'm going to see what I see. But within that, themes will emerge and I don't know what they are. So it's that balance between, and this is hard for perfectionists because I know for me, I want all the answers before I start. And you can't have that. You have to be braver than that. You have to say, I'm going to give myself these loose boundaries and I'm going to start taking photographs within those boundaries, but I can't predict the exact outcome. I have to let that evolve. 
documentary filmmakers understand this. It's like, you can't go in with the answers. You have to go in with the right questions. If you, if you go in with the answers and you start doing interviews, you'll push people towards what you think the answer is. And that's a mistake because then it's your opinion. Instead of going in and getting a bunch of people that you want to talk to about a subject with the right questions and then seeing what emerges and let the documentary take its course. I think that, especially for personal documentary projects, is a great approach and something that I haven't, I mean, I haven't really put to good use yet. I'm starting on a project now that's really trying to focus on that approach, but I'm kind of very early doors with that. And, and I, I'm, I'm probably not the guy to talk to because I'm no expert. Someone like Peter would know much better than me. But I'm 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 excited to sort of get my teeth stuck into that now. Now that takes me on again rather beautifully, and you're right about Peter and and that journey up the A1. We spoke in, in depth about that, and it was fascinating right. to hear him talk about it. But for Peter, Peter is a he's also a photographer and a filmmaker, and it's something I didn't speak to him about. So I'd quite like to speak to you about it, if that's all right. How do you find? As a photographer and a filmmaker, how do you divide your time on a project between the two? And I say that because I struggle. If I'm, if I'm doing two at once, you can only do one job. You can only either be the photographer or the filmmaker. You can't do both simultaneously. And the amount of times I, I will maybe be photographing something and think, oh, my gosh, this would look fabulous on film, or the... Mm the reverse of that filming something and think, Oh, I wish I was photographing this. It'd look great. Yeah. How do you, how do you divide that time when you're on a personal project between photography and filmmaking? Uh, I, often I don't because you're right. I think it is very, very hard to multitask like that. I can think may, maybe that example of that mentors project back in South Africa, I did those portraits. Maybe that would be an example of a time I did, um, the way that I work that works for me is in that instance, uh, I film all my talking to camera pieces completely separately. I don't want to waste anyone's time to sit around for that. So that's all done on a different day or different days. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I'm doing the photography, that's what I'm focusing on. And I might set up cameras off to the side that capture B-roll of me taking photographs, but that's a very easy thing to do. Just stick a camera on a tripod that films course, me yeah. while I'm working so I can just focus on working. It's very limited because if I actually hired someone else to come and film that for me, they could move around and do a bunch of different shots. That would be a better way to do it, but I have trust issues. so, that's, <laughs> like, so uh, and, uh, and a limited budget. Um, and then... Um, and then, yeah, it's just a case of then going out and capturing a bunch of B-roll that I think will complement what I'm talking about and the story that I'm telling that can also be done on separate days. So the photography, if photography is happening, the photography comes first and the B-roll can happen of that photography happening. Um, but the filmmaking all gets done around that where possible um, and on separate days because I can kind of, I mean, there's lots of tricks you can do, you know, I mean, that, for example, that video that I, that film I made about taking those portraits with those with those mentors, I mean, most of that B-roll was done. I mean, none of it was done on the days I was taking photographs. But there's just ways that you could capture things and talk about things when you're filming that you can cut over the top and make it a more visually interesting experience. But you can separate those things out into completely separate time blocks. But I, I would say if you are taking photographs, hire someone to do the B-roll of that because you're not going to be able to do both well if that's important to you. Um, yes, that's in, in hearing you talk about it. That's also the answer, isn't it? You, you, you literally cannot photograph and film the same thing. Whereas the project you're talking about, and actually we'll, we'll come on to some context just so listeners know what we're talking about. But for that project, you were filming your photography journey. So you were never photographing and filming the same thing, if that makes sense. Let's uh, yeah. just for some context, would you mind telling the listeners what that project was and how it how it worked for you? Yeah, it was really simple. I just I felt like um, the, the little backstory to it was that I've been doing a lot of um, actors headshots and model portfolio portraiture, that kind of thing, which is fine. I don't mind doing it, but I it, it just felt it started to feel a little bit repetitive and a little bit meaningless in that. Um, it served their needs, but it just, oh, 
to be really frank with it, and I, I don't mean this unkindly, but it felt like I was I was taking lots of pretty photographs of of attractive white people who need to get jobs. That's what the day job was. So it was all the kind of same kind of look how sexy I am poses and the and the you know slightly coy raised eyebrow duck face stuff and I just I was getting kind of sick of it and 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 I wanted photographs with more with more grit and meaning to them that were less that were less glossy like that that were more honest that were more gritty that were more I'm not trying to look good for you I want to show you who I really am digging under the surface a bit so mm -hmm. I took myself to Namibia and took a series of portraits of the Himba tribe and uh, I came back with those images and I was really happy with them um, and they felt like a step in the right direction and that they definitely weren't trying to pose for the camera. Um, there was a lot more openness and honesty in those images. Um, but the feedback I got from that from a, from a very talented printer in London was these are technically good photographs, but I don't care about them. They're just, they're just technically serviceable photographs of, of really interesting looking people, but I don't feel a connection in this. And I took that feedback. I, it's not that I don't love those images. They hang on my wall downstairs. I, I really i am proud of them. But he, I understood what he was saying. He was right that there was, I needed to dig deeper still. I needed to go further. And I thought, well, how can I take portraits that connect more to my story? And I thought, well, how about if I go back to South Africa and do something very simple, just take black and white portraits at one light on a black background of three men who mean a great deal to me so that maybe by connecting the, the imagery as closely as I can to my story and these men who in the absence of a father in my own life, because my own dad left home when I was four years old, these men stood in the gap at different parts of my life when I desperately needed a good male figure to help me through a stage where I was struggling. It, it, there would be images that celebrated who these people were to me personally. And I think to date, they're the most meaningful portraits I've made. And I think some people have said they can they can pick that up in those images as well. Um, and I don't know how these things work. You know, I don't know if if we dig deep and put ourselves in the images, or at least our story, or some vulnerability from us, and there's some vulnerability from the people in front of the camera. That there's some kind of alchemy that happens that mean when people look at those, they they pick up another level to what's going on beyond what I was doing. And like I said, I'm very happy to still do it. I do it all the time, taking kind of the the glossy model photos of look how attractive I am, hire me for this ad campaign. Oh no, there's deep story here. There's pain in this. There's a loss of a father. There's generosity. There's grace from older men who see a struggling younger man. There's a lot more openness and meaning and narrative in images like that. So that's the project that I went back to do. And they, they are the, the, the simplest shoots I've ever done. They were 10 minutes each, those shooting sessions. They were, they were really easy to, to edit and put together. They were, they, there's nothing technically interesting about them, but I think there's a, there's a depth to them that my other work doesn't have. And that taught me a lot in that I need to dig deeper. And this project that I'm embarking on now has a connection to my story again, because I learned the lesson. I need to put as much of myself in this as I can, even if it's not seen by people. I think, I think a lot of people pick up that there's more to it because of how much you put into your work. I would agree that about the connection as well, when you look at the images, they, they really are, they're beautiful images. And the way you've, again, it's back to what you were saying earlier. It's the, what were those three Ps again? Prepare, plan, and pre-visualize. It feels, when you watch the documentary of you talking about the journey of that, it feels finished. And by that, I mean, you do something very, very simple, but clearly well thought through with the images at the end. Mm. they're in they're in sequence so you have yeah. the subject in the middle looking straight down the barrel but then the images to the side on all three subjects are yeah. the same you've got one looking down i think it's down to the left and then up to the right and it feels yeah. <laughs> for the perfectionist it feels finished it feels very clean yeah. and very um just ready you know that's the only way i can describe it it feels it feels finished yeah, and I mean that the pre, that's where the pre-visualization came in for yeah. me. So I had a mood board on my wall of a mixture of photography and classical portrait paintings, and I, I think I showed it in the in the video that I color coded yes. it. So I, I I maybe had, and I just put this together on Pinterest and then exported it and printed it out. I maybe had, um, you know, 150 
thumbnail images of different paintings and photographs of portraits. And I would have color code. One would be, I'd put a, a blue dot on every image where I thought the lighting was interesting. I put a green dot on every image where I thought the positioning or the expression was interesting. And I, I kind of went through this color code and I sort of, in the mix of all those, I could see what I was aiming at. And that's where I came up with this idea of, uh, it's only nine images, the project. It's, it's three people, three images each. I wanted that down the barrel direct stare and I wanted that kind of thoughtful contemplative down to the side shot where you're not looking at the camera. And I wanted mm -hmm. something that was some more hopeful looking up to the light shot. And, and I, I mean, nine images, I knew what I was aiming at because I'd done that research and it took, it took looking at those 150 to work out. This is what I'm resonating with in these images. And, and maybe this would be a very simple solution to kick that out. So just giving myself those very simple boundaries. It's like, I knew at the start, I'm going over there to get nine photographs. That's it. And then I'm done. And it was nice and clean. That preparation is so important as well. And it's, it's been a consistent theme with all of these conversations. It's the difference between good images and great images is that preparation beforehand. As an example, Philip, <laughs> Philip Lee Harvey, bless him, is a travel photographer. And he was going, I think it was the Arctic he said he was going to. And he said the temperatures he knew would, would play with the camera and, yeah. and how it how it worked in those conditions so he he had a friend that worked in asda and he went and sat in the freezer in the big chiller freezer <laughs> in asda to test the cameras yeah and it's that it's that level of dedication and what you've just said then looking at those 150 images and and taking dots to to pick out the ones you want that is yeah. what it's that preparation that that delivers great images mm. have you got another example of something similar to that where you've done something maybe unique because i've not heard of that before it's something i've never done is is looking at lighting and then and then putting dots on each one i think it's such a wonderful thing and i'm definitely going to do it going forward yeah. you got another example of uh, a level of preparation that you've done for a shoot um i mean there's always ongoing preparation in mm. terms of uh in terms of the portrait work in general, like I'm, I'm always got a mood board, which I'm playing with um, to sort of hone my style of portrait photography with lighting. So, and, and everything else. I mean, when I, um, when I started taking portraits, the minute I got into strobes and actually not shooting natural light, but shooting in a studio with strobes, I think I did what everyone does and got kind of overexcited with it. And, and uh, just started adding more lights and then lots of colored gels and lots of different sort of crazy modifiers and reflectors. And it just became a visual mess. And I knew it, I knew I was, I knew everything was just too heavy handed. The editing was too heavy handed. My retouching was too heavy handed. And that dissatisfaction made me realize, okay, I'm not, I'm not paying attention. I've just got excited about techniques and I'm not paying attention to what sort of images I want to produce. And I got very deliberate about uh, making mood boards of the, the the portrait photographers who've worked, I really respect. And it took me an embarrassingly long time to realize the obvious that that my favorite portrait photographers shoot with one light. And it's the simplest kind of photography. And then I had to work my way back to all this, all this like technique and trying a lot of extra stuff. I think I think that impresses beginner photographers. And, and might get you attention online, but I hate it. I hate my own work when I do that. Like, I don't like it. I think it looks a mess. I, 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 I was looking at photographers like, um, like Irving Penn and um, uh, like uh, what um, uh, people like uh, Peter Lindbergh were doing when he was sort of shooting a studio with a, with a big overhead Kina flow, mm -hmm. uh, a gridded Kina flow that's like a one light, this kind of more earthy, uh, gritty, simplistic, one light um, stuff was what I was actually after. So when I put that mood board together, it made me realize in general, put the toys away, work on one light, one light and do it well. And it, what, a, what a freeing release to realize, like, I don't, I, don't, I don't need tricks. And when I do it simply and well and classically, I, I love it far more. And it was that research, that kind of preparing, that kind of, 
um, doing doing that and that's physically with photo books you know you buy photo books you actually flick through them and then you you bookmark a dog ear pages be like gosh there's something about this portrait that really sings to me work out what it is and then reverse engineering the lighting there was there was a great blog years ago i think it's still online called guessthelighting.com right okay. where, which actually taught me how to read lighting i think a lot of us look at images but we don't we don't really know how it was lit. This guy used to take yes. famous Vogue covers or whatever, and then he'd draw lighting diagrams of how he thinks that was lit. And watching those made me get better at reverse engineering lighting to the point where I could look through those photo books and go, hang on, what are they actually doing here? It's not the mess you're making, it's simpler. And that was, yeah, do, doing that kind of research in general all the time, and it should be ongoing. That, that kind of helps you define your style, you know? I think that is one of the beauties of the digital age is is being able to zoom in on someone's on a on someone's pupils on an image and mm -hmm. try and spot and work out the how the photographer yeah. yeah how yeah. the photographer has lit it. Yeah. Um, this may feel like a, a slight segue, and it possibly is, but there is there's logic for where I'm going here. But again, it's about the the prepare. What are those three Ps? Come on, Matthew. Prepare, plan, and pre-visualize. Um, you self-publish, and we'll come on to talk about your, your latest book shortly. But one of the things that I noticed when you were talking about how you self-published one of your books was that you, and it sounds like such an obvious thing to do, but I imagine there's a lot of people that who are thinking about publishing their own work that probably it hasn't crossed their mind. You you printed off the images that you were potentially thinking of for the book and laid them out on the floor mm. and put them in a certain order. It sounds so obvious, but again, would you mind talking through what, what that does for you in terms of putting together a narrative for uh, a book? Yeah. So the background for that, for people who don't know, like I, I put out a book at the beginning of every year, I've done it for the last four years um and it's just a it, they're called the collection series so basically this year was collection four next year january will be collection five and the goal i set for myself is you know i post an image to, to instagram every single day most of them are you know i'm not super proud of them but my goal is to try and get 90 images in any given year 45 color 45 black and white that i am happy enough to put in um book might be generous it's probably like a fancy zine it's substantial it's 104 pages mm. but it's um uh, uh printed on kind of un like nice uncoated matte paper that's a, a a kind of representation of what i saw in that year and the better images i took in any given year and i've just learned that and i learned this from my friend um, joshua jackson who's a incredibly talented photographer um that sequencing is everything you know, selecting the best images is actually not the trick. It's having a, a flow to the images in the book that makes visual sense and takes you on a bit of a journey. And that might mean that you swap out better images for, for quote unquote worse images to help the flow of those that book because it's far more important. Um, like your hero images might actually throw things out of kilter. And sequencing is I find very, very difficult to do by moving thumbnails around on a desktop in a folder. I don't, I just don't, I don't, I, I find it very frustrating. So what I do is I get onto uh, photobox.com, I think it is. Yes. And um, I just order my top 200 images from a year in physical prints so that I can lay them all out on the floor and then I can move them around. I can put them because the other thing is not just the run of those images in a book, but it's also where two images will sit side by side on a page. Did those complement each other within the run of the book? Um, and I find it much easier to do that physically by moving photographs around and taking some out and putting them back in, leaving that setup, going away for a couple of hours, coming back, looking at it again, and just having the process over a day of playing with that order and moving things around that I can then snap a photograph of and go, okay, that's the order. And then I can start to arrange it in the actual document. I find it as a much more um, tangible way of, of, of laying things out that helps me. How difficult is that to, to potentially take out a hero image that you adore and that you really enjoy 
but doesn't quite fit with the flow. How hard is that? It's, it's got easier for me because I, I've, I'm now convinced that it's a stronger book if you get the flow right. And mm. I want the book to be right. So I don't really struggle with that now. And I also know that taking that image out doesn't mean it dies. It just means it might go somewhere else in a different format. I could sell it of as course. a print on my website. So it's not, it's not that it disappears or becomes irrelevant. It just, I want the book to be the strongest it can be. And so the flow comes first and I, I, I'm uncompromising on that now. So yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really bother me. I, I know kind of the reasoning for it. So how does it work for you in terms of, obviously that's if you're laying out a sequence for a, a zine or a book, how does, how does your workflow look if you've, say, for example, you've done a day of street photography and you've got back from taking the card out of the camera to export? What does that journey look like for you? It's simpler than that, actually. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. It's, uh, where is it? So this is, the, um, this is the little camera I use. It's just a Ricoh GR3. They're little point and shoots. So everything you see on Instagram is this little guy. Um, that just, and it's great because it can sit in my pocket and go everywhere. Um, so that's, it's a, it's a fixed, it's an 18 mil, but it's an APS-C sensor. So it's a 28 mil equivalent uh, camera. So that gets shot, everything gets shot on this uh, in RAW. And then I don't take the card out ever. Everything then gets Wi-Fi across to my phone. Uh, when I'm out and about, so I'll shoot for a couple of hours with this. I'll go sit at a coffee shop, Wi-Fi the images I like across to this. And then uh, Lightroom Mobile, probably 30 seconds for each photograph. If, it, if I need more than 30 seconds, it's a bad photograph. I won't usually edit it. Um, export it and kick it out online. And I, I, I usually, I mean, those, those images, I, I print them and put them in exhibitions and I've edited them on my phone because the edits are so simple, it doesn't really make a difference. If I, if, on the rare occasion, I might feel like, oh, I want to take a closer look at that. I'm not sure about something. But because it's Lightroom CC, I can get home and fire up Lightroom and, and everything syncs anyway. So the image is there on my computer and I can have a little tweak with it extra. But this is th this is what I love about the shooting I do for Instagram is it's is it's so it's so low tech and simple and portable. It, I mean that that's my that's my my camera and my editing and everything in a, in a pocket. And and I just like that process. I, it feels really freeing and and fun and lightweight. So that's kind of how simple I I keep that. Do you know what? That has absolutely blown my mind. <laughs> really? Yeah, well, I, I, I guess maybe, let's say I'm from the old school, but my, you know, it's, it's take the card out and then run it through Lightroom or wherever it mm. is and then, and then edit it. I, it hadn't even occurred to me to edit it on your phone. How easy is that to do to edit from oh, yeah. your Super phone simple. on Lightroom? I mean, I've, I've got, I've, I've got a couple of videos that show me doing it. Um, I mean, it's uh, this is a, a Galaxy Note 9, so it's an older Samsung. But what I like about it is it's got the little uh, the little stylus, ah, which yes. is pres pressure sensitive as well, and just means you can be a little bit more accurate with the sliders and stuff in Lightroom. Um, every now and again, I might even do a bit of dodging and burning with this as well, um, like very simple, simple moves. But yeah, I mean, it, I don't struggle with it at all. It, it 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 works fine for my needs. And if I wanted to do detail editing, it would be terrible and it wouldn't work. Or if I wanted of to course. do any kind of heavy editing. It would be a nightmare, but I deliberately keep the stuff I do out and about very simple and try to get it in camera. So I don't need to do too much. It's a great antidote to the portrait work I do because that's very different. That's the Sony a7R4. That's like 60 megapixels and, you know, bringing it into Capture One and processing it and then bringing it yes. into Photoshop and working on it for half an hour, 45 minutes with retouching. This is supposed to be, it, it's like going back to that idea of, I kind of want to keep some of the spirit of walking from the station home with the iPhone. Yeah. I, I don't want it to get very complicated or technical. It should just be fun and simple and easy. So that's for me, how I like to keep it. And what was the camera that you said you use for street photography? It's a, it's a Ricoh GR3. Um, the, the, these little GR cameras, um, lots of street photographers know about them. Um, they're, 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 they've got quite a rich heritage with street photographers. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, there's things that people don't like about them. I mean, they, they don't have a viewfinder. So it's just the screen on the back. Some people don't like shooting with a screen. Personally, I like it because no one cares if I'm walking around taking photographs with this. I just look like a confused tourist. I, um, think, it, I think it's that. I think that is the important thing with that camera. Because I'm, yeah. I'm that guy that was strolling through Langkawi 
not last year because we couldn't go anywhere, but the year mm. before with a 5D and a 24 to 70 on it. And you look ridiculous. You look like paparazzi. That is far more yeah. subtle. Well, I, I'll show you. It actually does have a little a little viewfinder that I very rarely use, but it's like a little... Um, oh, I see. see. That guy? Yes. So you can actually, if you wanted to, you can actually shoot with a viewfinder. You just clip it on the top like that and you can use it with a viewfinder. But I find this action alerts people that I'm taking your photograph. Yes. Like putting this in front of your face. Whereas actually what I often do with this, you know, I could, I could just shoot around like this. I just, I mean, it looks the size of a phone. People don't really clock too much what you're doing. So you don't, I think Joel Meyerowitz calls it bruising the scene. You don't bruise the scene by alerting everyone and changing their behavior that you're yes. there and you might be taking photographs. I mean, often I, I shoot to uh, waist level with my thumb like this um, so that it's sort of out the way and not disturbing anybody. Yeah, things are. I think that's a really interesting thing. What did you call it then about um, when you changed what people, people's it's reaction? It's John phrase. He called it bruising the scene. Bruising the scene. Yeah. Basically, if you stay somewhere too long and you're obviously taking yeah. photographs, people around you will change their behavior. And street photographers in particular are trying to catch candid behavior with people who are unaware, going about their daily lives in their natural mode. If they've recognized you, you've changed them and now you're photographing their reaction to a photographer rather than their genuine action just going about their day. I think it's so interesting as well to hear different people's perspectives on it because what you just said about bruising the scene is a really it's something I talked with Peter Dench about in depth because he somehow manages to get really close-up shots of people mm -hmm. and they're they're completely unaware seemingly mm -hmm. of him mm -hmm. and they can't be and his technique is to is to spend time getting to yeah. know the people that he's photographing and, and in the environment that he's in so he almost becomes part of the environment and they forget he's there whereas yeah. what you're talking about with that and using that particular camera is it's a far more subtle way of shooting, which I think a lot of people will, will find useful. I think it's one of those fundamental differences between street photography and documentary photography is, mm. is you can't hide your presence as a documentary photographer because yes. you often need to get access and permissions and to be hanging out with people. Um, I mean, Peter's alcohol in England stuff is a good example. Yeah. He's sitting at the table with people at pubs he's been having conversations with them for an hour and then he's just sitting there taking photographs quietly. They're very aware that he's taking photographs, but he's, he's getting to know them and, and letting them fall back into being comfortable in that situation, yes. even though he's there. So he's almost getting like a, a post comfort by them just getting used to his presence, even though everyone knows the deal. Whereas a street photographer can't do that because everything's fleeting and moving and they're gone. So you need to get that first honest moment before they're even aware of you it's the only way you can do it and because you're not following one person around for an hour on the streets you get arrested to try and wait till <laughs> they get comfortable with you again so you're you're, you're um it's a, just a different kind of it's a, the kind of the different natures of those genres of photography i suppose yes i agree i agree right i'm going to ask you some quick fire questions and i'm not looking for anything yeah. deep nothing meaningful cool. just your gut reaction so black and white or color well i, I until very, very recently, when I've started posting more color, I, I post one of each, one after the other. So I, I, for most of my Instagram, it's one black and white, one color, one black and white, one color. Because for me, I think they're equally interesting and important for different reasons. Do you, when you take an image, do you instinctively know what, yeah. what it's going to look better in? Yeah. So um, if there's an interesting color or interesting color in the shot and that makes it interesting, it'll stay yeah. color. If the light and shadow is more interesting, but there's nothing specific about the color, it'll go to black and white. It's, it's really that easy for me. Um, because okay. I think, I think strong, strong light and shadow often looks better in color when you are in black and white, rather when you strip out the color. Um, yes, yes. But if, if the color's a feature, then it, it will stay because it's, it'd be a shame to throw it away. It's part of the image. You know, Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Uh, right, Canon, Nikon, or other? Uh, uh, I love Canon. I mean, I shot Canon for the first 10 years of my career. Um, these days, I am a Sony shooter. And the reason is because uh, they, for me at this point, are the best value for money offering for hybrid shooters who shoot equally stills and video. 
And um, I'm, I've, I've been with Sony for the last three or four years and I, I couldn't be happier. I've got no plans to change. They are more than enough bang for the buck for me, for, for doing both. I think filming, they are far and away ahead of the competition. Um, yes, I couldn't agree and more. The, the A7, and they have been for a long time. Canon, Canon, the reason I started with Canon was because the 5D Mark IIs and what they were doing with filmmaking. Mm. They were the early, you can shoot video through these beautiful lenses on a big full frame sensor and it looks incredibly cinematic. But they realized they were starting to cannibalize the sales of their video cameras. And so they started to take away or hold back hamstringing some of those yes. video specs in the DSLRs. And I'm like, well, I'm out. I'm going to go where they're going to give me everything I need in one box, which is the Sony's, because I don't want to carry two separate systems for everything. I'm not yeah. buying your C200s and your 5D Mark IIs and, all, and everything and having huge backpacks. I want one backpack with, at the moment, I have two A7Ies and one A7R4 and four lenses. And that will give me everything I need in one camera bag for all the all the stills I could want to shoot and all the video I want to shoot. And that's the important thing to me. I'm sure you're not the only photographer as well that is uh, that stumbled across that with Canon. So there's probably yeah. people listening going, yeah, I know exactly that. Yeah. When you'd film with a 5D and go, why have you done that? That's real. Oh, because you want us to buy yeah. a C300. <laughs> right. Uh, film or digital? Digital for me, um, I, uh, I do shoot film. I've got some medium format and 35 mil film cameras that I shoot for fun. Mm. Never done it for a job or for work. It's just, re it's really more of a hobby. Um, yeah, I, I, I firmly embrace the digital era. I love how fast I can move, how accurate I can be and how, how I can far easier get the hit rate. I'm really not overly romantic about film. I, I enjoy it and I appreciate it for what it is. But I love a clean image. I don't want mm. a load of grain that is uncontrollable, but I'm supposed to love it and embrace it afterwards because it's so beautiful. I, I want the clean image and to add that afterwards if I choose. But usually I, I, I love a clean image. So I'm happy to be a digital person. Yes, likewise, likewise. I think I know the answer to this, but tripod or handheld? I very, yeah, I very rarely use a tripod. When, when would I use a tripod? Product photography, I used a tripod all the time. I mean, all the street stuff, obviously, with this little point and shoot is all handheld. Of course. Most of my portrait photography is handheld because I like the flexibility of being able to move with somebody and adjust to their body position a little bit. feels a bit like a dance. Locking it off on a tripod can feel a bit static. Plus, it puts a barrier between you and your subject, I feel, which can make them feel a bit more uncomfortable. You're already surrounding them with light stands and backdrops. Putting that tripod directly between you, I feel, can be a bit of a barrier. Yeah, handheld. Okay. All right. Flash or natural light? Oh, it's equally both for me, I think. Okay. I mean, I, I like that I, I, I'm in love with natural light and, and the uncontrollable nature of it and hunting out good light in the day to day stuff, walking around the streets. But equally, I love the control I have with that with strobe when it shoots port, when it comes to shooting portraits and mixing strobe and natural light for portraits is something I really enjoy as well giving that slightly uh, hyper real feel when you're adding a, a subtle kick of strobe into a natural light scene in a way that's hopefully invisible or not too noticeable but just kind of elevates the light that's available so i'm equally both i think okay and finally home or abroad <laughs> i love to travel I, I do love to travel and I, I don't, I don't even know where home is, honestly. I mean, I've moved around so much in my life, you know, growing up between the UK and, and various countries in Africa. Um, yeah. I, 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 I'm always trying to find those intimate details at home. Uh, but again, I've, I've just moved up to Yorkshire. So, I mean, this is a new part of the world for me. Uh, that doesn't feel like home yet. It's still, I'm still in the honeymoon Hollywood, uh, that honeymoon kind of holiday phase with this place. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but I, I, I love to travel and see new things. So yeah, I'll probably travel. All right. And finally, what is the most important item in your kit bag? Doesn't necessarily need to be a physical item. Um, Uh, I don't know. Probably the thing that jumps out at the moment is the, 
my uh, 50 mil lens. Like I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, I've fallen in love with that focal length over the years. And I think if I, now, if I had to choose just one lens or one focal length to shoot, even though the 28 mil with this little point and shoot is my, my daily run of the street, it's, it's 50. Like that's the lens that I'm most excited with. It's what I shoot all my portraits on. And it's what I want to go back to exploring more with on the street. So I think a good 50 mil prime. Yeah. It's an excellent lens really is. Sean Tucker, thank you so much for allowing me to spend a small portion of your Friday with you. Now, where can people go if they want to find out more about you, about your work? Where can they find you? Uh, YouTube, just punch in my name, Sean Tucker, S-E-A-N-T-U-C-K-E-R, um, at Sean Tuck, S-E-A-N-T-U-C-K on Instagram or Twitter. Um, um, yeah, that's that's me. My website is sean tucker dot photography so yeah any of those will get you some info that was my conversation with the wonderful sean tucker a huge huge thank you to sean as always for taking the time to speak with me here on the show if you enjoyed the episode as much as i enjoyed talking to sean please support the show with your words not your wallets this show is completely free and that's how it will always remain so please don't Go on to Patreon and buy a pen or a coaster or buy me a coffee, in inverted commas. The show is completely free. So please, if you do want to support it, support it with your words, not your wallets. Reviews are incredibly important. And if you can find the time to do it, we really, really would appreciate it. And finally, like I say, if there is someone that you want to hear in conversation, drop me a message on Instagram or Twitter at Matthew Walker T. V. For now, thank you as always for tuning in. I've been Matthew Walker. He has been Sean Tucker. This has been the Standout Photography Show and you have been nothing short of sensational. Until next time, take care.